Hey, you're listening to the Smoke Meat Podcast. I'm your host, Brad Pittman. Smoke Meat's brought to you by Joe's Underground at the corner of 8th and Broad in Augusta, Georgia, in the bottom of the Lamar Building. Jeremy and the gang make you feel like family the first time you go in there and every time you go in there. So, everybody going down to Joe's, have a drink, have a thing of cheese sticks, just sit down, make some new friends, hang out with your old ones. Guarantee you're going to love it. Remember, I goes to Joe's and so should you. Joe's Underground at the corner of 8th and Broad in Augusta, Georgia. Today, my guest is the lovely, talented, and smart, just wonderful lady, Sue Wong. I know you're going to enjoy hearing me talk to her today. Well, more like her talking to me. She is so, man, she, she was such a great, great interview. I love talking to her. Such a great lady, so... I'll gush all day, so we're just going to get to this beast here on Smoked Meat. So how you doing today, Sue? I'm doing pretty good, getting, getting ready for America's big holiday, and uh, I have so much to be uh, thankful for, actually, because even though I'm originally a daughter of China, I grew up in this country, and I'm very grateful to be an American, you know, and I'll tell you why, because... I basically was uh, born in a very remote little village in China, sort of, uh, you know, like a little village that time had forgotten. And it was very much like, uh, you know, 16th century China, um, except, um, you know, it, it, it really was in the, in the back roads of, of southern China. So um, America is my adopted country. And I came here to join my father with my mother when I was six and a half years old. Um, my mother and I escaped China. She basically, you know, considered my father to be the one big love of her life. So she really wanted to be reunited with him. So she basically took a big leap of faith when I was, um, oh, I guess, you know, five and a half years old. Uh, we left China. Um, and she had sewn her uh, wedding jewelry into this small little pillow, which I remember clutching, you know, and she gave it to the border guard and he released us to our freedom. Um, and we were met by um, relatives on the other side in Hong Kong. So, uh, you know, uh, and then we lived in Hong Kong for about a year before my father petitioned, you know, um, for, for, for me to be, to come here with my mother. So anyway, um, I wanted to read you a little, you know, post that I did. Um, so because it's sort of a tribute to America and to all immigrants. So um, the title of it, is, you know, I did it for Facebook and, you know, Instagram. It's called Lady Liberty's Torch from Mother to Daughter a realization of the American dream. And I am the embodiment of the American dream that basically uh, you can, you know, pull yourself out of the ghetto. You can pull yourself out of ignorance and poverty. You just, you know, have to have the will and the tenacity to do it. So anyway, I'm going to read this to you real quickly. Okay. So I said this was a very powerful post of my China childhood. And I felt compelled to share it with some of my newer friends. Nearing the eve of Independence Day, it is, not, it is hard not to contemplate the beginnings of my journey from Maoist China to actualizing and establishing my own Suwong American dream. In the profound context of July 4th, the state of independence lies the greatest gift and hope for turning dreams into certified realities. I am most grateful and humbled by the blessings I have received, but none of it would have been possible if it weren't for the greatest goddess, the wisest teacher in my life, my mother. I was born in a remote village in Maoist China, and I grew up under very humble circumstances. In a bold attempt to be reunited with my father, after being separated by the closure of China, my mother took a blind leap of faith and bribed the border guard with her wedding jewelry, who released us into Hong Kong and to our freedom. My father had quickly escaped and returned to America to where he had immigrated as a young man. It's hard to reconcile this austerity 
with the opulence of my current lifestyle and all the accoutrement of my current lush life and fame. However, coming from a reduced minimal background makes me appreciate the value of abundance, which I was fortunate enough to have channeled through my creativity and hard work in my adult life. And then I showed a picture of me as a three-year-old and my mother with her Maoist haircut and her proletariat, you know, blue uh, cotton uniform. So I said, this is a haunting, poignant photo of me as a three-year-old and my mother in Maoist China from another time, from another lifetime, long, long ago. America was made by pioneers and it takes tenacity and unwavering commitment to turn dreams into manifest reality. I share my success with my mother, who instilled all the core character in me that prompted and propelled me to success. To my mother and my father, both immigrants, who came to this country and were courageous, And to all brave immigrants before me, I extend my immeasurable thanks and gratitude for being my beacon of light in our land of the free and home of the brave. And I am proud to be an American. That is awesome. Do you like that? (laughs) I'm sitting here. I got goosebumps on my arms right now. That is awesome because that is the American dream. Well, I just really feel that, you know, with all the bashing that America has received lately, you know, that um, I wanted to really pay a tribute to America, you know, which is really my adopted country. Um, And I basically grew up here. I'm not near, you know, native. I mean, you know, I've, I've been here since. I was six and a half years old. When I came here, I didn't speak one word of English, but I just really wanted to, you know, like for all the people who basically put America down and burn flags and all of that, I mean, they don't know how good they have it in this country because they have not, you know, I mean, I think what they should really do um, is... uh, you know, they, they, they should really try living, you know, under a totalitarian, you know, regime because, you know, they think that we don't have, you know, like a freedom here. Mm-hmm. Well, let them try to live under a, a totalitarian regime like I did. Do you know that after a while, you know, the communists basically, they took away our cooking utensils and kitchen, you know, uh, effects. And we couldn't even cook our own meals anymore. You know, you would, you know, ration off a bowl of rice with some vegetables at the end of a day of hard work, you know, and that was it, you know, uh, and you had to really eat from a common mess hall. So all the people who really complain about, you know, I mean, you know, I'm I'm completely self-made, you know, and this uh, land at least gives you the freedom you know, for that kind of opportunity. I mean, I lifted myself out of the ghetto because when I first came here to America, I was thrust, you know, in this tenement building, infested and crawling with rats and cockroaches right off of Skid Row in downtown L.A., you know, towards the corner of Ninth and Crocker Street. If you know L.A., you know that that's really Skid Row. And my father worked in a, you know, commercial Chinese laundry across, uh, I mean, around the corner. So I know what it's like to really, you know, grow up in the ghetto, you know, uh, grow up in poverty and scarcity and ignorance. But, you know, you lift yourself out of that and you just really, you know, have a desire to really better yourself. So I feel that I am the embodiment of the great American dream. And I, you know, accomplished my first American dream when I was 25 years old. And then I lost it all again by the time I was, you know, 30. (laughs) But, you know, you still really have a chance to really make it here because America is still a great free country and a place where dreams can be realized. And like everything else, is it perfect? No, America is not perfect. And some things need to change and be improved for the better. 
But like I said, you know, um, they should really, those who really cr- criticize America, let them try living in a totalitarian state. You know, like a lot of people are really pro Marxist and all of this kind of stuff, equality for people mm-hmm. and anti capitalism. Well, you know, let them try. And then when their, you know, freedoms are revoked, then <laughs> let them really just start screaming, you know. Then perhaps they will come to recognize the freedom and the liberties that we do have in this country. Mm-hmm. And we take our liberties for granted here in America, you know. We take our freedoms for granted. So, you know, I'm so grateful for all the opportunities that were given to me. And I, I did grow up in the ghetto. I grew up in South Central L.A., you know. At the time, it was predominantly black. Um, we had, uh, you know, some Asians. We had Chinese, you know, uh, Japanese, a sprinkling of Koreans, Latinos. I think all the, you know, white folks had fled by then, you know. So what I'm trying to tell you is that I came from less than nothing in terms of my circumstances, you know, because my parents were poor, struggling Chinese immigrants. Mm. But I decided to make something of my life and of myself. And if I can do it, then others can do it, too. And I would say... What it really takes is determination, focus, and tenacity. And I would say the first thing to really uplift one's consciousness is education. Because, you know, without education, there's no hope to really raise your consciousness, you know. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I think, you know, I agree with the great Buddha when he said that the root of all human suffering is ignorance. You know, and ignorance, I would define as, you know, mental darkness, you know. So if you really want to get ahead, go get yourself an education and uh, uplift your consciousness. Then one's will and desire to change one's lot will determine everything after that. And that's how I did it, you know. Yeah. You know, and that's one thing people today, you know, uh, when I when I grew up, my dad died when I was ten years old, and my mom had never worked before. She had always been a housewife and a mother, and right. we we grew up poor. I mean, really poor because, you know, mom didn't have any any other skills. So we lived off of my dad's right. retirement and social security. And I know what it's like to be hungry. You know, not to know where that next meal is going to come from for a couple of weeks and. Yeah, you know, it, it made know, me where uh, I've, I've been a paramedic that, that's for 30 the way it years is now. For, for a lot of us, but those yeah. who want, you know, to dream of a better life and better circumstances for ourselves, we lift ourselves out of that, you know, scarcity consciousness. Yeah. And, you know, we go towards really, you know, limitless abundance because it is an abundant universe. You know, most people don't realize it, though. So they really get stuck in limitations, in poverty, you know, in blame on other people, in envy, and, you know, in victimhood. Yeah. And I have never been a victim in my entire life, you know. Yeah. I've always taken the bull by the horn, and, you know, I'm really of the, you know, belief that we really are the masters of our destiny. And, you know, I have this mantra called think, act, and become. Mm-hmm. So, you know, your your thinking is very important because all thought, you know, is energy. You know, everything in the world is, everything in the universe is all energy. And that's what Einstein, one of my favorite heroes, always taught, you know. Mm-hmm. So, you know, you have to really be careful of what you think, what your thought patterns are, whether they're positive or negative. If you give any of those thoughts energy, if you give your thoughts positive energy, they will manifest into positive outcomes for you. If you live in fear and scarcity and envy and, you know, uh, darkness and constriction and, you know, all of that stuff, that will also become your reality. So what you think and what you act upon and how you feel about things And even in, you know, whatever you speak, because words have really power. 
So basically, the, all of that becomes your manifest destiny. Mm. And people don't realize that, you know. Yeah. But it's really true, you know. Yeah. And I, I feel that my living, you know, my, my uh, own personal life is really living proof of all of that. Yeah. And, you know, like I said, we, we grew up hungry. And today's people, you know, America, like I say, I, I love her. I love my country. And she's got some yes. problems right now, and we, like I say, we got to fix them. But everybody well, kind of wants everything right, right now. now because yeah. um, there's too much division. Yeah, there's too much self-serving interest. Yeah. There's so much uh, separatism, you know, and people, you know, basically they, they are not open for dialogue. They're just really like they get stuck on their own ideas and their own self-righteousness. And they think whatever they believe is the only way. It's, it's the you know it's their way or the highway. Yeah. And that's not the way it is, you know. Yeah. Um, I did a post where I you know uh, quoted the uh, Indian uh, philosopher and writer and teacher J. Krishnamurti, who basically spent a lot of time here in um, Ojai, California, not too far from Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to quote him. And uh, he said, when you call yourself an Indian or a Muslim or a Christian or a European or anything else, you are being violent. Do you see why it is violent? Because you are separating yourself from the rest of mankind. When you separate yourself by belief, by nationality, by tradition, it breeds violence. Mm -hmm. So a man who is seeking to understand violence does not belong to any country, to any religion, to any political party or partial system. He is only concerned with a total understanding of mankind. Mm -hmm. You know, so that's what I, you know, uh, believe in because, I mean, there's a huge tug of war right now going on with the Democrats and the Republicans and, you know, I have friends on both sides of the fence and, you know, my Democratic friends are trying to persuade me over to their side of the fence and, you know, um, <laughs> my my Republican friends are trying to really, you know, like uh, rationalize their cause and everything else. Mm. And I just really decided to stay out of it because, you know, politics is a slippery slope, just like religion. Yeah. You know, when you start to talk about religion and you talk about, you know, whose God is the only God you know, or whose politics is the only right politics, you know, that becomes, you know, uh, sort of like um, a uh, dangerous gray zone, so to speak, you know. Yeah. So um, I just really believe in the you, you, uh, the um, unity of, of mankind. I just really feel like we're all part of the human race, you know. I personally am colorblind because I grew up in the ghetto. I grew up in this full ethnic ghetto. So I had an experience of, you know, from my childhood of just really accepting, you know, everybody. And, you know, as an adult, I see people as souls. I don't really see them, oh, they're black or they're yellow or they're red or they're blue or green or white or off-white or whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have two children, you know, of, um, you know, who are ethnically, uh, racially, you know, mixed. Mm -hmm. And maybe that is the only way for mankind in the future to come together and not talk about race anymore. Because I am hoping that, you know, in the future, hundreds of years from now, whatever, you know, that humanity can really get along better because, you know, people no longer can say I'm black or white or Asian or, you know, Indian or whatever, you know, because I think in the future, you know, everybody will be mixed and maybe there will be one race. So, you know, all this race stuff will be a thing of the past. That's mm -hmm. what I'm hoping. Yeah, you know, as as a paramedic, I've seen the blood of every nationality, every sexual orientation, every race, you name it. And if if you put a drop of your blood next to a drop of mine, I can't tell who's whose. Everybody's the that's same, you know. True. That's quite true, you and, know. So I think people should yeah. just really 
come together and work together instead of all of this division, you know, you're, you're wrong and I'm right and all the self-righteous attitude and, you know, like, uh, you know, it's, you know, I, I'm, I'm never really a political person, you know. Yeah. I really, you know, have never been a Democrat or a Republican. You know, there are plus points from both parties. There are also negative minus points from both parties, you know, so um, I think instead of just really, you know, like getting at each other and, and, you know, have this incredible battle going on, there should really be, you know, some sort of effort to, you know, basically work together for the common good of the country, you know, because it's really the people, again, who really suffer whenever there's really politics involved. And, you know, uh, war and, and, you know, strife and everything. It's always the people that really suffer. It's not really these, you know, big leaders or anything else or these big interest groups or, you know, um, yeah, it's really the people that that really, you know, suffer. And so, yeah, I would really like to see some reforms, you know, and I, I think the first place to start is education because I really believe in education, Yeah, you know. Really, you know, like lifting yourself up out of the ghetto, out of ignorance is the only way to really, you know, come into some sort of enlightenment as a human being, you know. And that's what did it to me because basically what saved me was from the age of uh, seven or eight years old, I had a neighbor, you know, um, who had a son my age. And, you know, like, um, I was really underprivileged, of course, and, you know, my parents were struggling. They didn't have time to do all of this. But, you know, they took me all around. They took me to Disneyland. They took me to Knott's Ferry Farm. And the greatest gift that the mother, you know, of Gordon Young, my playmate, the greatest gift she really introduced me to was the Grand Central Library in downtown Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. So she took me there, you know, to the children's wing, got me a library card and, you know, I was growing up in South central LA and I'll never forget, you know, my mother gave me a full dollar and back in those days, you know, the, that, we're, we're talking about you know, late fifties, yeah. a dollar got you very, very far. It got me a, a, um, a, a bus ride, you know, from uh, South central to uh, at Martin Luther King Boulevard. It wasn't called Martin Luther King Boulevard back then. It was called Santa Barbara Avenue. Mm -hmm. So I would take the bus from Santa Barbara Avenue all the way to downtown, got off in Fifth Street, and then, you know, walked up about probably five or six blocks to the Grand Central, which was really on a hill. And I would really check out my 10 books, you know, and I was an avid reader, and that's how I basically learned English because I didn't know a word of English when I first came here. Mm-hmm. And uh, then I would really, you know, like have money for, you know, a hot dog and a, and a you know, soda at J.J. Newberry, just right down the hill um, on Fifth and Broadway. And then I probably would have, you know, like uh, 17 cents or something left over to buy some trinket or a little bottle of nail polish. That was really my treat every two weeks, you know. Mm-hmm. So I learned to read at a very, you know, young age. I became really uh, mentally and intellectually uh, curious. And I've always loved literature. I've always had a love for the English language. Um, I love uh, reading. I love writing as well. And, uh, you know, so, you know, I I got very interested in uh, philosophy in uh, you know, religion or comparative religion and uh, world literature, even American literature. I mean, all of it was really interesting because then when I was about 12 years old, uh, my parents decided to open up their own Chinese hand laundry Mm -hmm. in basically what was really suburbia, squeaky clean suburbia back in those days, which was Culver City, you know? So, um, you know, I remember we were reading, you know, Shakespeare in the seventh grade and by the time we were in 11th grade, we were reading, you know, French existentialism. You know? <laughs> so it, it was a different era, you know, and I think the kids really need a motivation 
and they need um, inspiration to learn these days. Yeah. Because a lot of you know, a lot of the kids are not well educated. You know, yeah. I mean, I was uh, at my house in, in my I have a sanctuary in um, on the island of Maui in Hawaii. Uh, tucked away in in the uh, pristine jungles of East, of East Maui, and I remember I was interviewing this young man for a, a gardening job, and so he came into my house, sat down on the sofa, and I had a volume of Shakespeare on the coffee table. So he picked it up. He picked up the <laughs> volume of Shakespeare, and he goes, "Hmm, Shakespeare was he before Christ?" <laughs> <laughs> So this is what's going on in in the world these days. You know, America's young folks need to be inspired to learn and to read again and to just really learn about life, learn about the world, and, you know, just put down their cell phones and their computer games, you know? You know, I, I taught myself to read when I was four years old. You know, I watched Mr. Rogers oh, and the you Electric go. Company. See, you and, know, so you, you've always had a love yeah, for and I, I love know, reading, reading I love and books. literature and, you know, writing. And I'm, I'm sure that that's yeah. what it is, too, you know? Yeah, and I, I love it. I mean, it can take you to a, just a whole other world. It, it's such a great thing. And actually, oh, yeah. You know, it's, I mean, you it's know, education. I, I, I would always love reading the original uh, book more than watching the, the, the movie, oh, you yeah. know? I mean, when I was growing up, I, I couldn't put down, you know, the uh, Swiss Family Robinson, for mm-hmm. instance, you know. Mm-hmm. And then when I finally saw the movie, it was kind of a letdown. You know? yeah, I'll tell but, you a you book know, I When you're read. reading, you know, as a child um, and even as a, an adult, you know, you just let your imagination really, you know, uh, run, run with it. Mm-hmm. And, you know, the, the story develops in your head and it sometimes is you know, like the visuals in your head are so much more interesting than, you know, uh, how somebody interpreted it as, as a movie, yeah. you know? Yeah. And, you know, there's one book I would love to read. I saw the movie when I was a kid. Um, it was called My Side of the Mountain. And it's about this mm-hmm. little Canadian kid who's probably like 10 years old but loved science and all that and was enthralled with Thoreau. And he yeah. ran away and went up on the mountain. Well, you know, there's there's so much, you know, like depth and so much uh, beauty in life. Yeah. I just don't understand people who really get depressed or, you know, like uh, not interested in life, you know, because there's so much to be thrilled about. There's so much, you know, to uh, learn and to be curious about. And, you know, I, th- I think, you know, the human journey is, is, is a beautiful journey, you know. And, uh, you know, I wouldn't have really missed this ride for anything in the world, to tell you the truth. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's funny. People say if they could go back, they would change things or they regret doing this. I wouldn't change a thing, and I don't, I've never done anything I regret. I've done some things I probably should regret, but every little bitty thing has put me on the path where I'm at. Every, Everything that I've well, done so far put me talking to you right are now. Illuminations that come too late, you know. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you know, I guess they say, you know, hindsight is always better than foresight. Yeah. But you know, I don't think there's really such a thing as really a bad human experience because I think you know whatever travails we have are basically you know tests of spirit. You know, I mean. I think it's really, we're meant, whatever our karma is, whatever our de- personal destiny is, whatever lessons we have to learn, you know, those are basically, you know, like um, experiences that are sort of like, you know, set up for us by, you know, uh, for lack of a better word, by our energy, by our, you know, mindset, because these are lessons that we have to pass through somehow in order to become you know, more wise human beings, to be more knowing human beings, to be more kind and more compassionate human beings, you know, Mm -hmm. whatever the lesson is there, you know, uh, there's a purpose, there's a higher purpose for for all of it. So, you know, because that's why I just really don't perceive anything to be a negative energy or, or not negative energy, but a negative experience. I mean, 
And I really have been tested in a great, great way because I have made two fortunes and lost it both times. And then both times I had to really start all over again. So it's sort of like the phoenix rising, so to speak, you know. But yeah. I don't really, you know, like allow, I'm not deterred by anything that comes my way. You know, whatever arrows and slings and, you know, are, are cast your way, you basically make the most of it, you know. So it, it's not a matter of what lessons are thrown at you. It's basically how you deal with each situation that really gives rise to your spirit or your, you know, or, or it, it creates downfall for your spirit. So mm -hmm. it just really depends on what you choose, you know? Mm -hmm. I know. And, you know, it's, it's funny, you know, you talk about karma and, and, you know, we, we talk about regrets. It's funny. The, I, I believe in karma fully, but I mean, that's just, it, I've seen it so many times. Um, uh, well, it, it happens for, you know, the, both in the East and the West, um, yeah. You know, in, in the Eastern Hindu and uh, Buddhist tradition, karma basically really is the law of cause and effect. Yeah. Basically, it's whatever uh, energy you put out, whether it's ill will, you know, and evil and dark thoughts, that will boomerang and come right back at you, you know? Yeah. And conversely, if you have really beautiful thoughts and you you know, do beautiful things in life, that will come back at you too. So you have to kind of look at karma as a, uh, you know, basically a system, um, you know, of your credits and of your debits, basically. Mm -hmm. Whenever you do a great deed and you do a kind deed and you're compassionate and uh, loving and kind, you get, you know, brownie points for your, you know, um, credits column mm -hmm. and conversely when you do something negative or hateful or you know just dark and you commit you know an atrocity against another human being or you're you know jealous or envious or any of those dark emotions that will also come back to you so you know in the east they call it karma and then you know in the bible you know in in the uh west you know uh there's a passage that goes something like, you know, vengeance is mine, said the Lord, you know. Mm -hmm. So basically, you, you know, like, give it up to God's hands, basically, or to the laws of fate and to the laws of the universe to really, you know, make what is wrong right, mm -hmm. you know. And if somebody commits an atrocity against you, you don't personally have to really get revenge because, that person will, you know, will basically take care of, of uh, himself or herself, you know? Yeah, so he, here in the South. It, it, it's, a, it, it's a way of the universe equalizing itself for everyone. Yeah. You know, here in the South, our saying is that wheel comes right back around. And if you do wrong, it's oh, going to crush true. you. Oh, that's true. That's <laughs> true. Now, where am I speaking to you from? Are you, are you which part of the South? I am in it, or just south of Atlanta. Oh, you're south of Atlanta. Yeah, I I'm, see. Yeah, I'm in. Fayetteville. I haven't been to Atlanta for a long time, but I remembered it as a beautiful city. You it, know, it is. It's it's having some pains right now, but everybody is, and it's it's good. It's strong enough. It's going to be be all right. It's going to be. Well, fun. I can just really hardly wait until this election is, is over. I think this is probably the most disturbed election year I've ever seen. Oh, you ain't where people kidding. are basically, you know, um, separated and divided, you know, in their personal ideologies. And, of course, everybody is screaming that they are the right, you know, yeah. mindset and everything, you know. Yeah. And, uh, you know, like I said, what's really disturbing is that there's really no dialogue, you know. Um, people don't really allow for any dialogue to really take place except for their own voices. And, you know, that's not I, how I think a democratic, you know, process works, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's for sure. I mean, everybody thinks that they're right and everybody else is wrong, you know, and 
I've learned. Yeah, it, well, you know, I think, you know, people need to learn more tolerance in the world, yeah. you know? And I'm, I'm amazed at the amount I mean, that I have learned over the years. Whatever happened to tolerance? Whatever happened to, you know, listening to the other side, you know? Yeah. People need to really stop being so rabid and so, you know, self-justified, and they need to really listen to the other side and see what they have to say. But yeah. they're really stuck, you know, and I think it's really political ego, you know, for lack of a better term, you know? Yeah. There's just too much. They're caught up in, and stuck in too much political ego, I think. You know? Oh yeah, and you know I'm I'm just ready for it all to be over and everybody to to kind of be normal again. You know what I mean? Yes. Well, I don't know whether it's ever going to get normal again oh, yeah. because now you have so many people who are militant and you know so gung ho in what they believe in. You know, mm. but um, I just really think that you know people should just really stop and see what is really for the betterment of of humanity. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and just really do what's the right thing, you know, for, you know, for everybody, for everybody concerned, not just really for, you know, a certain, you know, groups or, or corporations or, you know, these, you know, uh, big entities. And, you know, um, there has to be probably less corruption in the, on the government level. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, we really do need um, our young folks to really get a great education. Maybe they should start, you know, uh, teaching ethics in, in, in school. Maybe the first thing they should really learn, you know, besides the academic stuff, is to learn how to really be a decent human being, you yeah. know, to treat people with respect, because I think there's a lack of respect going on in this country and in this world in general right well, now. Well, I have a story that will give you a little bit of hope, and this is my personal experience. Um, a few weeks ago when all the riots were going on and – that's all that was on the news was the big riots. Yeah, where, where I, I work at, that. where I work at, I'm a paramedic, and we had some some groups that were having two big block parties, and they were groups that hated each other. I mean, they not fans of each other at all. That was right. one night. The next day, we had two demonstrations. They were they were permitted demonstrations. You know, they'd done all the paperwork and everything. And because of the news, all of us were expecting all hell to break loose. And you know, yeah. my, my little town, all weekend long, everybody got along. There was not a single problem, but the news won't show any of that. They want us to see fighting, well, want to try and divide everybody. Well, the news won't show any of that because a, a lot of the, it's manipulated. Yeah. You know, it's manipulated by private interests, yeah. you know, by political parties, you know, by big corporation, you know, with interest to serve. So unfortunately, a lot of the news that we get um, is not the real news. You know, it's fake news or it's manipulated news. Um, So, you know, the best thing to do is really not listen to American news, maybe listen to the BBC or something like Mm -hmm. that. You know, Uh, you might really get a more impartial picture of what's going on in the world and even in within our country here. Yeah. Well, I tell you, Sue, I've had a ball talking to you today. And you know what's funny is I've, I've, I've got on here. I was actually expecting to talk about fashion and I've had a great time. I mean, you are such an intelligent lady and just such a great story. Oh, thank you. <laughs> and you, you know, you're welcome yeah, we back. We didn't even on get here. a chance to talk, talk about fashion or, you know, what I'm doing these days. Yeah. Actually, I'm not doing fashion as much. I'm, still a designer but you know i really have started my first um su wong signature home you know i'm restoring this 1928 um you know old hollywood uh grand hacienda and uh you know so i'm really basically reworking a lot of the vintage uh, elements of the 1920s Uh i'm designing my own wrought iron my own you know um uh, you know the wrought iron flourishes. I'm designing the you know beveled glass. I'm designing the period um, Mexican tiles with Talavera, mm-hmm. and it's just really going to be stunning. Oh, you're and then, have you know, to of course, I'm creating this whole uh, outdoor California lifestyle. You know, with a gazebo and cactus gardens and you know uh, uh, saltillo uh, tiled um, you know patios. It's going to be sensational, so I'm very excited about that. Yeah, you're, you're definitely going to have to send me pictures as you go along on this thing because that sounds amazing. Oh, yeah, I, I definitely will. I definitely will. 
So um, anyway, um, do you have any other uh, questions that you would like to, to ask or uh, to talk about? No, I'm actually good right now. I mean, like I say, I'm, I'm just, I'm tickled at how this has gone and I'm so happy that you came on here. Oh, and great. You, well, thank you. Thank it, you so much for having me. You're and, welcome uh, anytime. You know, maybe here. next time you, if you have me on again, we'll talk about fashion and my whole journey in fashion. And, you know, because I was a fashion designer for so many years. Yeah. And, um, you know, I've, I, you know, probably racked up about uh, over a hundred accolades and awards over the years. Mm -hmm. you know? So, <laughs> uh, you know, it was a great career for me, but, you know, I, I remain a creative artist. And I just really want to do, you know, other things with my abilities and my talent at this point in my life. You, you, do, know? you do exactly what inspires you, Shug. You do exactly what inspires yes. you because that's what keeps it rolling. Well, it's, it's, it's been, a, you know, I've lived a very inspired life. I've lived a very large life. And like I said at the beginning of this interview, when I read you my post, I'm very grateful for, you know, the, the many opportunities that this great country has given me. And I'm really appreciative, and like I said, I'm proud to be an American. 